Okay, so today I'd like to talk to you about uh, work I've been doing in the last, I would say, uh, two years or so, about a new approach to um, trying to understand cosmological correlations uh, that was inspired very much by kind of the S matrix bootstrap that you heard from Yutian uh, just a, a moment ago. This is work I've been doing um, initially together with Nima Akani Hamid, um, Hayden Lee, and Guillaume Pimentel. Um, but now we have a, a large group of, of postdocs and students working on it. Um, in particular, I'd like to highlight Wei Ming Chen, who is maybe in the audience. Um, so he will be able to answer your questions after the talk, um, who's doing work in progress with us at the moment. Um, so, okay, so let me start. Let me start by reminding you that cosmology is a special type of science in the sense that uh, we don't have repeatable and controlled experiments. All we can do is we can look at the universe, we can try and see patterns in the universe, and then try to explain those patterns using cosmological evolution. And one of the first things we notice when we look at the universe is we see that the structures around us are not distributed randomly, but they're of course correlated over very large distances in space. So in particular, at late times, we see correlations in the positions of galaxies. At earlier times, we see correlations in the microwave background temperature radiation. Um, and even we can even take these correlations and trace them back in time all the way to the origin of the hot Big Bang, where they live on the so-called reheating surface, which I've indicated in gray here. Um, so this is kind of the initial surface at the beginning of the, the hot Big Bang. And then what we find is that the correlations are of such a type that it seems to be the necessary to have a phase of cosmological evolution before the hot Big Bang that created these, these correlations, but we don't know exactly what that early phase of expansion was. Um, we think that it was something like inflationary expansion. That there was a period before the hot big bang where the universe expanded you know, exponentially fast. Um, and uh, I'm gonna be assuming that this was the case um, and be working in the context of inflation. So what happens in the case of inflation is that this reheating surface, this initial surface at the beginning of the hot big bang gets, gets uh, connected to the future boundary of an approximate Sitter space time. So this is what I've indicated here. There's inflation at early times and we don't know exactly how inflation happened and what type of inflation occurred. That's what this question mark represents here. Uh, inflation ends at the time that we call T equals zero and transitions into the hot big bang where all the radiation and matter of the universe was created. And it, uh, we have correlations living on that, that surface this gray line here is a spatial surface, um, which you can either view as a spatial surface at the end of inflation or at the beginning of the hot big bang. And so the question we're asking is, can the correlations living on this surface be bootstrapped um, directly? Meaning can they be determined by self-consistency alone rather than having to evolve you know, nonlinear fluctuations during the inflationary era, which uh, often is kind of complicated. Um, and it's complicated for the same reasons that scattering amplitudes uh, are hard to compute sometimes in the case of Lagrangian methods, um, especially in gauge theory and in gravity. Uh, what happens there and what happens here is uh, that there's unphysical gauge degrees of freedom that one has to keep track of that do not affect anything in the final answer. And so we'd like, just like in the case of scattering amplitude, we would like to make use of the fact that on-shell physical observables at late times um, are simpler than what seems to be suggested by the off-shell you know, Lagrangian description. Um, so it has a conceptual advantage, just like in the case of the S matrix, that we will focus directly on observables. Only physically observable densities will enter in our calculations. Um, and then related to that, it has the practical advantage that it simplifies calculations, just like in the case of the S matrix. Um, that uh, uh, things will become dramatically simpler because we are taking this point of view where everything is just described on this final surface and we make no reference to evolution in the bulk space time. Um, so maybe this is not necessary to slide since you already heard Yutin's beautiful talk, uh, but just to remind you that this bootstrap perspective has been very influential in the case of scattering amplitudes. In that case, the rules of quantum mechanics and relativity are actually very constraining. So the space of possible or self-consistent scattering amplitude is highly constrained by unitarity, locality, and Lorentz symmetry. And so we'd like to ask whether there's a similar rigidity um, for cosmological correlators. Are there similar rules that cosmological correlators have to satisfy, like locality, unitarity, and, and Lorentz symmetry that will restrict the space of allowed cosmological correlations in a very similar fashion? 
And so the goal will be to develop an understanding of these cosmological correlations that is on, on the same level as the understanding that we have for flat space scattering amplitudes. And we're, we're really just at the very beginning. We're starting to understand tree level processes. Well, in the case of scattering amplitudes, of course, there's much more understandings that even at the loop level, okay? But so we're making beginning steps towards kind of a similar on-shell descriptions of cosmological correlations. Um, this connection to scattering amplitudes is also relevant um, at a very practical level because it turns out that the early universe was really like a giant cosmological collider. So because the universe was expanding very rapidly during inflation, the expansion rate was as high as 10 to the 14 GV maybe, um, this rapid expansion of the space um, can spontaneously produce massive particles. So this is what I've indicated here. Uh, so this is a space-time diagram with space running up and spa uh, time running up and space to the side. Two particles can be spontaneously produced. And because they're massive particles, they don't live very long. So they will decay into inflaton particles and then produce non-trivial correlations on this, sorry, on this final set, uh, on, this, on, this, on this final boundary. And so our goal is to describe these signals that arise from particle production in the, in the bulk space time. And so to be able to use the early universe as really a cosmological collider that produces very heavy new particles that we can then search for. Um, so at late times, these correlations then get imprinted into the distribution of galaxies in the sky. So these fluctuations are produced before the hot big bang, but then they transition into the hot big bang phase and into the evolution and, and structure formation. And so we hope to disentangle these signals and uh, and measure them at late times. But we need a systematic framework to actually predict the, the precise features of these signals. And that's what this cosmological bootstrap is also supposed to, supposed to do. Um, okay, so then the outline of my talk is gonna be the following. Um, I'm just, in the first part, I'm gonna give you the basic idea of this bootstrap method. Um, and maybe in my seminar, if I speak about this topic, I will tell you more details. And then I will describe for you a, a more recent work um, are trying to extend this bootstrap to spinning particles. So the first part is just gonna be about scalar correlators. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a few of the new features that arise when the particles have spin, especially when they're massless particles with spin. And then I have a few words about open, open problems. Um, all right. Okay, so let me start with just a basic description of the, the key ideas behind this, this new approach. Um, this slide is probably unnecessary. Let me just quickly mention it again, that the fundamental observables in particle physics are scattering amplitudes. Um, and there of course has been a recent, enormous progress recently, um, bypassing Feynman diagram expansions. So it turns out that Feynman diagrams expansions quickly become very complicated for scattering amplitudes. And, and one of the main reasons for that is that, uh, you know, they keep track of redundant gauge degrees of freedom and so things simplify dramatically when we describe things on shell. Um, and I should highlight that this is, uh, if you want to learn more about this, this is beautifully described in Yutin's book. Um, the thing that I want to just highlight here is that a lot of the physics of scattering amplitude is, is con controlled by singularities, okay? And so of course, this is well known to you, I'm sure, that if you tune the external momenta in such a way that the, one of the internal momenta hits a resonance, so hits the mass of a new particle, um, you get a pole. Um, the nature of this pole is fixed by Lorentz symmetry and locality. So for example, the fact that this pole is a si simple pole and not some higher order pole is completely fixed by locality. Higher order poles would be non-local. Um, and then on this pole, the scattering amplitude has to factorize into a product of lower order poles, on-shell lower order poles. Um, and so this factorization is dictated by, by unitarity. And it turns out that consistently factorizing amplitudes in all of these resonance channels can be very constraining, especially for massless particles with spin. Um, so these arguments have been used, for example, to, to show that uh, you know, the self-interactions of massless spin two particles are, have to be the ones of GR at, at low energies. And the self-interactions of massless spin one particles have to be Young-Mills theory in order to satisfy this consistent factorization in all of the you know, uh, exchange channels, ST and U channel, okay? Um, so this is, our, our motivation is to kind of take inspiration from this and ask, are there similar constraints for cosmological correlators given by their analytic structure, okay? So as I already mentioned, the fundamental observables in cosmology 
are correlation functions. Yeah. So they are bulk fields, capital, capital phi, and then boundary values of those fields that I've indicated by, by little phi here. Um, there's also a Feynman diagram like expansion of interactions in the bulk space time that then can get projected onto the boundary. But sim you know, like in the case of scattering amplitude, that Feynman diagram expansion quickly becomes complicated. Yeah, and uh, maybe not the best way of describing the, the, the physics. Um, and as we will see, a lot of the physics of these correlators is also controlled by, by singularities. And so I'd just like to explain to you first what these singularities are, because they're slightly different in the case of cosmology than they are in the case of flat space scattering amplitudes. Um, so first of all, every correlator um, has a singularity when the total energy of the process vanishes. Um, so here I've shown you a four point correlation function uh, with fluctuations living on the boundary. We often describe this correlation function in Fourier space where it becomes a closed quadrilateral. And so each of the side lengths of the, this quadrilateral describes the energy of the external particle, K1, K2, K3, and K4. Um, and the claim is that uh, this correlator and any correlator of any number of legs will always have a singularity when the sum of the total energies goes to zero. So the sum of the sides of this quadrilateral okay, goes to zero. Of course, this cannot happen for a physical process because some of the side lengths have to be negative, but you can reach this point in kinematic space by analytic continuation. And it's relatively easy to see why you have to have the singularity if you, if you remember how these correlators are calculated from the point of view of the bulk. What you have to do from the, in the bulk calculation is you integrate over time all interactions. And so you will always, and you integrate from minus infinity the origin of the space time to this boundary at t equals zero. Um, and there will always be this factor of e to the i energy times time. So for a scattering amplitude, you would also have this integral, but the integral would run from minus infinity to plus infinity. And it would give you an energy conserving delta function in this total energy. But now since we're integrating only over the half plane, um, we will not get the delta function of energy conservation, but instead we'll get the singularity, this pole at e equals zero, okay? Um, so this arises precisely because in cosmology, we do not conserve energy and therefore we have to replace these delta functions by poles in the total energy. And what's interesting is that the coefficient of this pole becomes in fact the, flat, the corresponding flat space scattering amplitude. Yeah? So the residue of these singularity, singularities contains information about the underlying scattering process. Okay? So in some sense, the, the, the scattering amplitude is a subset. It lives inside of the the correlator. Um, now, when you have diagrams with exchanges, then you have additional singularities. Namely, you have a singularity whenever uh, you know, a subset of the energies is conserved. So for example, in this tree exchange diagram, there can be energy conservation at the left vertex. Um, and when that occurs, you will have a singularity at the position of E left going to zero. So the sum of the energies entering the left vertex is going to zero. Um, and on the singularity, the, the correlator will factorize um, very much like the correlator was factorizing in the three level exchange scattering amplitude that I showed. Um, but now the, this factorization is in terms of a scattering amplitude on the left and the correlator on the right, okay? Because on the left vertex, you're taking the energy to zero. Uh, that's kind of taking a flat space limit where the vertex is dragged to minus infinity. It becomes flat space um, while the other vertex is kept finite and it remains a cosmological correlator, okay? Um, so this limit is very important because it puts a physical constraint on, cosmo on correlators or physical correlators will have to satisfy this, this factorization. And it also encodes the signature of new particles. So these, seeing these type of sing singularities in your calculations is a indication that new particles were present in the, in the exchange. Okay, and then finally, um, these correlators can have singularities in, the, in a collinear or folded configuration where you take two of the external momenta and you fold them onto the diagonal. Um, so it turns out in that limit, uh, generic correlators would have singularities, but correlators that start in the bunch Davis vacuum should be regular um, because these type of singularities only arise if the initial state has negative frequency components and that's, that's forbidden in the bunch Davis initial state. Um, so if we require the, the, the ordinary vacuum initial conditions for inflation, these, these singularities should be absent. And so it's another important constraint on physical correlators that you do not have any singularities um, in this collinear or folded configuration. 
And in fact, as has been explained in this paper by Green and Porto, um, the absence of these correlated, these, these folded singularities is, a, is an indication of the quantum origin of these correlations. So if there were some classical origin to these correlations, they would generically have these folded singularities and not seeing any of these folded singularities is te teaching you something about the quantum origin of these, these correlations. Um, okay, so these were the three types of singularities that we have. Every correlator has a singularity at total energy going to zero. Exchange correlations have uh, additional singularities, these partial energy singularities, when the energy entering a vertex adds up to zero. And then all the correlators should also have no folded singularities, okay? So we'd like to ask how far we get by taking these conditions as an input, yeah? So rather than viewing this as an output of a complicated calculation, we're gonna be using these singularities as an input and then try to bootstrap the rest of the correlator from this, uh, these special kinematic points. Um, so let's, like in the case of scattering amplitudes, let's start with three-point interactions. So in the case of three-point interactions, of course, you have no exchanges. So the only singularities that you have are this total energy singularity. And in fact, it turns out that this three-point correlator can be completely fixed just in terms of the corresponding three-point amplitude because there's no additional singularities. So roughly speaking, you just take the corresponding amplitude, you divide it by the appropriate power of the total energy, and this will give you the three-point correlator, okay? Um, and then in fact, this three-point amplitude will encode the symmetries of the process. So if this three-point amplitude is taken to be Lorentz invariant, the full three-point correlator will be the sitter invariant. Um, if you take a non-Lorentz invariant three-point amplitude, you will break the sitter symmetry of the cosmological correlator. Okay, um, so there's a nice interplay between the symmetries of the amplitude and the symmetries of the, the correlator. Um, now in the very simplest examples, it turns out that higher point correlators are fixed by their partial energy singularities. So if we start with these three point building blocks and you try to connect them to make higher point correlators, in the very simplest examples, they're uniquely fixed by the fact that they have to factorize correctly. Um, but that's, you know, usually that's a relatively rare um, circumstance. Um, basically for, for flat space correlators, this is the case, but then in, cosmo in, in the sitter space, this, this, this is not the case. And in the sitter space, we actually need a more, more general way of connecting these singular limits. So we know what the correlator looks like on these special kinematic points, but we'd like to know how they look like everywhere. And so how these points are connected in, in, in energy space. Um, so one way of doing this is inspired by just the fact that we know that from the point of view of the bulk, of course, local vertices in the bulk are connected by propagators. Um, and so we would like to understand, you know, this time evolution in the bulk space time, what does it correspond to from the point of view of the boundary of the space? Um, and the statement is that this, this time evolution in the bulk corresponds to momentum scalings on the boundary. So as the particles evolve in the bulk space time, um, you know, if they decay at later and later times, for example, this corresponds to deformations of the quadrilateral, changes in the correlations on the boundary of the space-time, um, they get squeezed and, and, and stretched um, depending on the time of decay of the particle, okay? So they want, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between time evolution in the bulk of the space-time and momentum scalings on the boundary of the space-time. Yeah? This boundary has no explicit notion of time, but uh, the effects of time are encoded in the dependence of them, all of the momentum. Yeah. How does the signal change if I'm changing the, the lengths of these quadrilaterals? If I'm taking these two sides and I'm squeezing it, the signal will change. And how the signal changes depends on local time evolution in the bulk. Okay. Um, but it turns out there's a way of describing this local time evolution in the bulk purely from the point of view of the boundary. Um, and it leads to a differential equation that these correlations have to satisfy. Yeah. So this four-point correlator, correlator describing the exchange satisfies this, this, this differential equation in terms of external momenta. So this, this momentum P here is a ratio between the exchange momentum Ki, this is this length here, divided by two of the side lengths, K1 and K2. Yeah. Um, so this gives me a dimensionless ratio and there's a second order differential equation that describes how the signal changes as I'm changing this dimensionless ratio. And so this is the left-hand side. It's, it's, it's describing kind of the flow in momentum space, while the right-hand side is just the corresponding contact amplitude, uh, contact correlator 
So this is the correlator that you would get if you shrink the two vertices to a point. Um, and so in some sense, this, this differential operator is annihilating the propagator and, and collapsing it to a contact interaction. Um, in fact, to give you some intuition for what ha what's happening here, this is very similar to what would happen if you take a, a four point exchange amplitude and you multiply it by the inverse propagator. So for example, in the S channel here, you would remove the, the exchange pole and you would just be left with a contact interaction. And so this is, this is the, the correlator analog of that, that statement. It's more complicated than it is in flat space because this is now a differential equation rather than this algebraic uh, relationship, okay? And so that's why cosmological correlators are harder because implementing this is, is trivial in flat space, but it becomes a, a, a more complicated task in, in curved space or in, in cosmology, okay? Um, so just to, to repeat, there's a source on the right-hand side which describes a contact interaction. This contact interaction would be determined completely by the total energy singularity. Um, and so this is an interaction that has no partial energy poles. And so by specifying the nature of the total energy singularity, I'm classifying this contact source. And then the differential equation will tell me what the full correlator is in the presence of these exchanges. Um, because this exchange operator here will kill the, any partial energy singularities. Um, so this is the fundamental equation that represents time evolution in the bulk from the point of view of the boundary. Um, and so we can now go and classify solutions to this equation and thereby classify the possible boundary correlations. Um, it, so let me just give you the three criteria that are required in order to specify solutions to this equation. First, we have to specify the correct uh, total energy singularity. This is, as I said, this is equivalent to specifying the source on the right-hand side. So you could classify all possible four point contact interaction, interactions of the theory. Um, that's equivalent to specifying all possible amplitudes or all possible total energy singularities. Um, next, we need to impose that it has the correct partial energy singularities when you solve this equation. Okay, this provides a boundary condition for this differential equation. And we need to require that there's no folded singularities in the solution, which is a second boundary, boundary condition. Notice that this differential equation is second order. So you need two, two boundary conditions. These last two requirements are precisely those two boundary conditions. So this has to approach the right limits when the, uh, some of the partial energies add up to zero and it has to have no folded singularities. Um, okay, um, so in principle, this is still not very simple because uh, there could be, uh, there's, an, it, there's a different differential equation for each microscopic process. So depending on whether you exchange a scalar field or a spinning field, or there's a scalar on the outside or a spinning field on the outside, and it has different masses. So each microscopic process during inflation uh, would correspond to a different solution to these, to these differential equations. And you might think you have to solve this differential equation one by one many, many times. Um, fortunately, it turns out that actually there's a, there's a rather remarkable simplification that arises because all these solutions can be reduced to a unique building block. Um, there's kind of a one, one exchange correlator uh, corresponding to the exchange of a massive scalar um, uh, between uh, so-called conformally coupled scalars. So these are special scalar fields in the sitter space, in the sitter space with masses square root of two times the Hubble rate during inflation. Um, in that, for this particular choice of mass, the differential equation simplifies. You can solve it relatively straightforwardly. Um, and so it gives you a unique solution. And then it turns out that that unique solution can be transmuted um, using so-called weight shifting operators into all of this space of more complex correlators. You can change the masses and spins of all the particles involved by acting on it uh, with another differential operator. Um, and so we don't have to solve this differential equation case by case. We just can solve it once for this seed solution. And then the seed solution can be translated into more complex correlations by just acting on it with a set of differential operators. Um, so there's a lot of structure that was uh, not completely obvious from the, from the start. So let me just describe what this, this uh, seed solution looks like. Um, so given the allowed singularities of the, the, the function, um, the seed function is uniquely specified. Um, there's actually a, an explicit formula that you can find in our paper, but it's not very, uh, it's not very illuminating. Uh, so instead of showing you this formula, let me just show you um, uh, a figure that illustrates how the signal changes 
with momentum. Um, so what I'm showing you here is kind of the, the strength of that four point correlation as a function of the internal momentum Ki, so the exchange momentum. Um, so let's start, for example, here at relatively large values of this exchange momentum, you have a, a equal side quadrilateral. Then as you're decreasing this internal momentum, um, so you, you're collapsing this, uh, this quadrilateral more and more. So you're shrinking the diagonal momentum. At first, the signal will change in a, in a smooth way. And this corresponds to just tracing out more and more different kind of contact interactions of the system. And then as you're squeezing it by a lot, this signal all of a sudden starts to oscillate. Yeah. And this oscillation is in fact a characteristic signature of particle production in the bulk space time. So massive particles in the sitter space will oscillate outside of the horizon. Those oscillations in time get imprinted in oscillations in this momentum space function. And this is what you're seeing here in the solution. So it was forced on you Although we never mentioned time in this derivation, this time dependent effect in the bulk, bulk space time was forced on you by the boundary conditions of this differential equation. So it's a completely static way of phrasing the problem, but it had time dependent information encoded. And in fact, you're getting time dependent information out of this, the, this solution, okay? Um, and it turns out, as you see from this plot here that this particle production piece in fact dominates as I'm squeezing this quadrilateral more and more, okay? So the characteristic signature of massive particles during inflation would be this oscillating feature that arises when I'm collapsing the internal momentum of uh, one of these four point functions. Um, so this is completely analogous to what we see in particle physics, but, but as resonances. So in the case of uh, particle colliders, we, you know, we study cross sections, of course. And so as we increase the center of mass energy of the process, Initially, the cross section will vary smoothly. And so this corresponds to just uh, probing contact interactions of the system. At some point, when you have enough energy to produce a massive particle, you see this resonance. And this is completely the analog of these oscillations that we see in the momentum space correlators. Okay. Um, so this, also this point of view was something that was uh, emphasized by Kani Hamid and Maldasena in what they called cosmological collider physics, um, because this is really. Uh, doing in the very early universe what you can do at colliders in a more controlled way. Okay. Um, so it turns out the frequency of these oscillations depends on the mass of the particles. So heavy particles will oscillate faster. And so as I'm squeezing this quadrilateral, this function will change as a sign of the mass and the log of the internal momentum. And so by tracing out these oscillations and measuring their frequency, you would measure the mass of the new particle. If the particle has spin, there's an additional angular dependence of the signal. So as I'm keeping this internal momentum fixed, but I'm rotating this around some axis, um, the signal will change as a function of the angle between the external and the internal momentum. And in fact, it takes the form of a Legendre polynomial of that angle um, of, of degree, the spin of the particle, okay? This is also completely analogous to what happens in collider physics. So in collider physics, we have a, a pole at the mass of the particle. And then on the pole, uh, the amplitude factorizes. And when you sum over all helicities, you will get a Legendre polynomial of order the spin of the, the particles, okay? So there's a completely analogous structure that appears in both cases, okay? Um, all right, and just to mention, of course, that although we're describing these fluctuations at the very early times, ultimately we think that these fluctuations will get imprinted in the late universe and, and they're in fact, experimental efforts like this spherics experiment that will, will search for these signals in the future. Um, and so if, if you wanna know about these, I'm happy to say something about them afterwards. Um, okay, maybe I should check how much time do I have left? Um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? 20, uh, 20 minutes. 13, okay. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say a few words. So, so far we have mostly talked about or exclusively talked about scalar correlators. Um, in inflation, this would be correlation functions of the inflaton field, which then give rise to density fluctuations. So these are the most important, of course, correlation functions that we observe on the sky. Um, but it's also interesting to actually ask what happens in the case of particles with spin. Um, and uh, and especially if these, these particles are massless fields with spin. Um, this is the case where the amplitudes bootstrap has been especially influential, uh, the case of gravity and gauge theories. 
Um, and it's not just an academic exercise because uh, let me first remind you why massless particles in inflation are important. Um, so first of all, it's just the fact that all massless fields are amplified during inflation by quantum fluctuations. Um, sorry, the quantum fluctuations of massless fields are amplified by the expansion, um, while massive particles decay and therefore are not observed at late times. Uh, and that every inflationary model has at, le has at least two massless modes. Um, so one of them is the inflaton, and that's the one we just described. Um, but then there's also, of course, always the graviton, um, which is a massless spin to a degree of freedom. Um, and unfortunately, not very much is known about graviton correlators beyond three-point functions. Um, in fact, maybe that's even an overstatement. Nothing is known, I would say, about graviton correlators beyond three-point functions. Um, and like in the case of amplitudes, directly computing them gets very complicated. Um, um, the, you know, the Feynman vertices become very complicated and the Feynman integrals become incredibly complicated and it's just a hopeless calculation. Um, so in that case, this bootstrap method is not just a, a luxury, but it's actually necessary. Uh, I would not know how to compute these correlators otherwise. Okay. Um, and so I just wanna make a few comments. So we haven't solved that problem completely yet, but uh, a few comments about structures that we are finding um, about these uh, massless spinning correlators. Um, so as before, let's start at three-point level. Um, and as before, three-point functions can be constructed directly from knowing the amplitudes. Um, you don't have to recompute. And so in flat space, for example, here I've shown you three, um, three examples of three-point correlators. So this is the three-point correlation of a spin S current uh, correlated with two scalars, and then two of these spin S currents and then three of them with different helicity assignments. Um, so we, of course, know we can easily write down just on the basis of little group scaling what the corresponding amplitudes are. And I've written them here. And so to, to then get the, the three-point correlators, you just have to take these answers and divide them by the total energy. Yeah, in flat space, that's just it. The poles are always simple poles. And so there's not much work to be done here. Okay. Um, and it gives you the answer for all spin. Yeah? So these are answers for three-point correlators um, for all spin. Um, and then it turns out actually you can take these answers and you can immediately relate them to the corresponding correlators in the sitter space, just because you know that the mode functions in the sitter space are related like this. So you can take the flat space results, act on them with this differential operator that you're identifying here at the level of the mode functions, and it will give you the corresponding the sitter correlators. Yeah? Um, and those actually become rather complicated functions rather quickly. You know, if I notice there's a product, product of many of these factors for high spin, um, they act on the sum of the energies and they produce numerators and higher order poles that become very complicated. Um, but conceptually, it's very easy, okay? You're just transmuting the flat space result to, to the sitter space. And so that then gives you, again, at all orders in spin, the, the necessary three-point correlators. And then the question is, can you take those three-point correlations and can you build up more complex higher point correlators using them as a building block, okay? So let me just give you one example in, example here, and that's the example of gravitational Compton correlations. Actually, this is something I heard in Yutin's talk at the end. I only was able to join at the end, but maybe he talked about gravitational Compton. Um, and so this is the, in, in cosmology, this is a correlator with two gravitons on the outside and two scalars, exchanging either a scalar in the S channel or another graviton in the, in the U channel. And so here I've just shown you the S channel result. So it has a relatively complicated pole structure with uh, poles at all the necessary locations. So there's total energy poles, there's left and right partial energy poles. Um, the leading partial energy poles are fixed by consistent factorization in the S channel. Um, the leading total energy pole is fixed by the amplitude, which this here becomes one over S just for the, for the amplitude. But then there's the, po the poles are starting to become of such high order that actually there's some subleading poles that are unfixed. And so it was not enough to just specify uh, partial and total energy singularities and their residues. You actually need additional information to, to get the full correlator. And so I'd like to describe what that additional information could now be. Okay. Um, so one piece of information that we haven't used yet is the fact that evolution in the bulk space time is unitary. Okay. And so there, there should be some constraint coming from the fact that we are describing unitary processes in the bulk and not arbitrary processes in the bulk. And so it was recently emphasized that unitarity in the bulk corresponds to a, a slightly different type of factorization on the boundary. And this is now a, a type of factorization 
that's valid not just on the singular point, but for all kinematic configurations. Um, so there's something um, that's that's uh, called the cosmological optical theorem because it's very much like the optical theorem in for amplitudes, um, where you know the sum of a four-point correlator and its complex conjugate with flipped energy, and this energy is a, energy flip is a slightly subtle feature coming from the nature of the bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagator, but roughly speaking, kind of the real part of this uh, this correlator is given by um, a product of three-point correlators on the left and on the right of the process. And these three-point correlators have to be slightly shifted. Um, you know, this is a, it's a combination of three-point correlators which shifted internal energies. This also just arises because of the nature of the bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagator in the sitter space. Um, uh, it's, it's a detail that I, we can discuss, but it's not so important for now. Um, but there's this formula that relates kind of the real part of the four-point function to a product of three-point functions at all kinematic configurations not just on poles. And so this gives you additional constraining power in determining what the correlation function will look like away from the singular points, okay? And it actually turns out that that information is enough in the case of gravitational Compton scattering in the S-channel to, to fix all these subleading singularities. So all these red terms here are completely fixed by this, this relationship. Um, for the U-channel, there will be additional contact terms that are unfixed and you have to use gauge invariance or the Wall Takahashi identity to fix those. Okay, so then it's a combination of unitarity and locality that, that fixes uh, the full structure of the correlator um, and connects these, uh, these singular points. Um, actually, in the case of gravitational Compton scattering, you can even use the trick that I used before of writing down what the, what the correlator is in flat space where it's very simple. It just has simple poles in all of the singular points. It's, you get this seed in flat space. And you can transmute it against again to the sitter space using the same differential operators that we used at the three-point level. And so starting with this very simple seed, you get this more complicated answer by just acting with these differential operators on the seed. Okay. So in that case, it turns out that the, the physics is still controlled by the leading order poles and the subleading order poles that were unfixed are linked to them by symmetry. Okay. And so they're not independent poles and they're actually fixed by this transmutation, which is a symmetry uh, transformation. Um, okay, um, so I'm probably out of time. Sorry, I lost track of time, but uh, um, I only have two more slides. So let me just summarize. Um, so I've described that symmetries, singularities uh, control much of the structure of cosmological correlators. I've shown you that there are simple building blocks that can be connected by unitarity and local evolution. Um, and I've also hinted that there are simple seeds that we can transmute into more complex correlators. Um, so there's an intricate, there's a web-like structure between fundamental correlators and kind of more complex correlators that are not independent, but they can be transmuted into each other. Um, and I've only shown very little about this, but uh, we actually now have a very large amount of theoretical data, at least large relative to what was known before. And so it will be interesting to analyze whether there are structures um, in these in these answers that are have so far been hidden from us. Um, a little bit like what happened in the case of amplitudes, that by writing these answers in a more unshell way, um, some symmetry structures became more manifest. And so we would hope that we would find similar structures in the case of uh, cosmology. And I think we now have the data to, to, available to actually look for these, these structures. Um, but as I said at the beginning, this is really just uh, the start. Um, so far, this bootstrap has still been performed channel by channel. Um, so STU channel, for example, in the case of two to two scattering were described independently. And of course, in this case of case of scattering amplitudes, uh, one of the main advances was to actually combine the channels and write down answers directly for the combined object and get rid of Feynman diagrams completely. And so this is something that still needs to be done in the case of cosmology. Um, most of our results were for the sitter invariant correlators. Um, and so it still remains to be seen how to classify breaking of boosts. Um, everything I said was in the, in the context of perturbation theory. Um, it would be interesting to know what, what non-perturbative bootstrap constraints are, like in the case of the conformal bootstrap where we actually know how to define things non-perturbatively. Um, and then everything was at the level of field theory and I have not yet included any constraints from the UE completion. And so that also remains to be, be done in the future. Okay, I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention.
Um, let's see. Maybe uh, uh, the speaker can uh, answer the question or my question first. There's one question from the online participant. Um, Sorry, in the chat? Uh, there is a question. Uh, what about the loop diagram? Yeah. yeah. Do you see it? No. No, I, I don't see it yet. I lost the chat. Um, yeah. What about the loop diagrams? Yes. Yeah. Will you answer that question first? Yes. Yeah, so we haven't studied loops yet. Um, in principle, kind of this, this optical theorem has a, has a so this optical theorem that I, I'm writing here. In the case of amplitudes, that of course was being used to relate loops to tree level uh, amplitudes. Um, and there's some work I know going on right now, not by me, but by this group that is uh, Payer and Good, Good you and Yazayiri that is trying to make connections to, between trees and loops using this optical theorem. Um, this differential equation that I showed um, in principle can also be applied to loops, I think, but we haven't done it, this one. Um, and I think what will happen is that if you put a tree level exchange diagram on as a source, uh, this differential equation will then generate for you a loop diagram. But okay, this is this needs to be shown kind of in, 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 in more detail. But basically, what because what this differential operator does, it, it it collapses one of the propagators. And so if you take a loop diagram and you collapse one of the propagators, you will get a tree exchange diagram. And so the, there's some rough indication that I think you could relate tree exchange to loops via this differential equation. Um, but uh, we haven't had time yet to actually explore explore this. Uh, are there any questions from the participants? So uh, thanks for a nice talk. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is this. Um, you mentioned that uh, unitarity involves uh, related to factorization on the boundary. Yeah. And I want to ask whether there is some form of holographic principle um, that is suggestive of this idea, for example, people doing um, DSCFT or some effort of UCFT or some cosmological background. Do you think it would be interesting to consider the holographic definition? Yes. The second question that I have relates to a uh, recent remark that we made. Um, so, with regards to loop corrections, um, I was just curious whether you guys did some form of UV regularization in your calculations. Because I recall that when Weinberg did the one loop calculation to the scalar return function, yes. um, there, there's some subtleties related to how you implement this. Um, yes. Thanks. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so, okay, I'm not sure if the first one was a comment or a question, but I agree with you that it would be interesting to make this. Well, first of all, let me say that this, this approach is very much holographic, um, but because we're describing things on the boundary, so it is, you know, very much what you would like to do in DSCFT, um, but it's not using detailed properties of the CFT yet. At the moment, we're just uh, kind of making a perturbative um, connection between kind of perturbation theory in the bulk and perturbation theory on the boundary. While in DSCFT, you would like to have some non perturbative relation between quantum gravity in the bulk and kind of uh, um, field theory on the, on, the, on the boundary. So that's, I think, very much, yeah, it's, it's definitely continuously connected to what we're doing, but it's a bit more in the future um, because it requires a non perturbative understanding of, of these things. Um, but it's also important to emphasize, I think, that what we're saying here is not dependent on DSCFT working in a specific way, the way people have des described it in the past. So uh, whatever the kind of correct formulation of DSCFT will be, I think will incorporate at the perturbative level what we're saying here, um, because perturbatively, these are just correct statements. There's no, uh, there's no, amount, no amount of uh, um, conjecture here. While in DSCFT so far, kind of, there's still most of the statements are conjectural. Um, okay, but otherwise I agree with you. It's interesting to kind of make that connection, but maybe that's a couple of years in the future. And then for your second comment about UV regularization, I think this is related to loops because, uh, so at tree level, this doesn't arise. And so since we have only studied tree level so far, there is no uh, UV regularization. Actually, and the issue is really IR. If I, uh, these loops actually ha have IR divergences. So the subtlety that Weinberg was encountering it's actually not a UV problem, but it's an IR uh, divergence. And so you might hope that these 
these bootstrap methods might teach you something about these things. Um, for example, in the case of amplitudes, you have this at one loop, you have this box triangle. Uh, what's the third one? Decomposition of integrals. <laughs> um, and that helped you actually to, what's the third one? Box triangles. Anyway, you think can tell me. Um, and then uh, this allows you actually to separate kind of divergences and regulate kind of UV divergences. And so you might wonder whether it's some similar decomposition of the correlators is possible at loop level and whether that can teach you something about IR divergences, which is an outstanding problem in, in inflation. Um, but since we haven't done loop yet, loops yet, this is not something we have encountered. Any other questions? So we still have time for one or two questions. Hello, so can I ask that uh, the, in which part of your calculation can capture the any uh, feature of the explicit inflation? So could you repeat? I didn't hear. I didn't hear the question. Uh, sorry, a, 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 from your, your calculation, a, 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 your calculation can capture uh, the features uh, this, this order of inflation. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's more in the spirit of an effective field theory, I would say, so that it captures kind of a whole class of models. It's all models where kind of the inflaton is coupled to a massive degree of freedom, um, which in some sense is then also probing the UV completion of inflation because we know that you have to couple to massive degrees of freedom in order to be UV complete gravity. And so very heavy states that will couple to the inflaton um, will have these, will lead to these, these effects. So I don't view it so much as kind of a, reflecting individual models, but reflecting a class of effective field theories where you have a scalar coupled to another scalar or a scalar coupled to a spinning field. And so um, in an effective field theory. So I think, and, and I like this about it, in fact, because it's it's not so specific um, as to only apply to very specific models, but it applies to any case that has a scalar degree of freedom coupled to heavy, heavy states. Um, which to me actually is every inflationary model <laughs> because every inflationary model has to have a scalar goldstone scalar mode uh, as the inflaton. And then it has to couple to massive states. Um, so the only question is whether those massive states are not too heavy so that they can be integrated out, then they, they would not appear, would not be excited enough to be seen. Um, and whether the signal is large enough to be seen. But for me, there's no question that these couplings have to exist at some level. Um, Uh, I think we still have one minute. Um, any question in the short term? Yeah. So, so maybe this question is related to the previous one. So all of our models with multiple scalars, and for example, can this better tell us something about our contribution? Sorry, I didn't hear the last statement. Can you put uh, so multiple multiple scalar fields, you say? So, uh, for example, the model models of inflation with multiple scalars. And yes. In this typical model, we have usually we have number of scalars. Yes. And, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So, in principle, it's not a problem to kind of describe them. Uh, I would say it's just kind of you have then. You know, you would have multiple scalars on the outside, so the correlators become kind of mixed correlators between the multiple scalars that are being involved. Um, the only challenge that happens for multiple scalars is that it becomes slightly less predictive because um, you can have evolution outside of the horizon. And so there's additional time dependence that you would not have in the case of a single scalar. And so that additional time dependence, you know, would have to be encoded on, 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 the, on the, the boundary somehow. Um, and so, um, yeah, but so, so in my mind, actually, there's always a one-to-one -one map between what happens in the boundary and what happens in the bulk. So, so in, in, in some sense, everything that you can do in the bulk is being described in the, in the bulk. The question is just whether the description of the, of the, on the boundary itself is simpler and more useful, more, you know, uh, in some cases it might not be simpler and you might just want to calculate in the bulk. But in many cases that I've encountered so far, the bulk calculations are very hard um, and not very instructive. And they have additional gravitational gauge degrees of freedom that you that never show up in your answers. 
And so, um, so far we have focused, focused on the cases, I think, where it's clear that the on-shell perspective will, will simplify things. In the case of multiple fields, it's not clear to me whether it would simplify things, yeah? Um, and you might as well just describe the, the model in the, from the point of view of the bulk. Um, Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. The next, yeah, we have a slightly uh, change of our schedule. Okay. The, the next speaker is uh, Andrew the Goldbeer. Okay, his title, the title of his talk is a recent development in regional physics. 